Um, well, when I first got here, I used to do this thing where I would pray and have you pray with me before the sermon, and then COVID happened, and I had to start recording sermons in front of a camera, and not any of you. So I got out of that habit, but I was gently asked this week if I could start doing that again, and I said, if I remember, and I remembered. So as we dive into God's word this way, we're going to start with three simple prayers, and I invite you to pray with me silently. The first prayer is that we would just pray for ourselves, our own hearts and minds, that they would be stilled and able to focus on Jesus and his word. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ gathered near and far, that they would hear God's word, receive God's word, and the grace and mercy of Jesus. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach clearly and accurately God's word and faithfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, as we go into God's word, as we continue to study what it teaches us about prayer, I invite you to open a Bible to Luke chapter 23, our gospel reading, but you're going to have to hold that because we're going to look at several passages this morning. So as you open in God's word to Luke chapter 23, I want to ask you a question or several questions that I want you to think about. How many of you are perfect? Few, few bold hands went up, and that's great. <laughs> All right. How many think you've always done it right? All right, now, now here's a little more of a realistic question. How many of you have been absolutely 100% wrong at some point in your life, but you still acted as if you were right? Anybody done that one? You're like, I know I'm wrong, and I'm losing this argument, but I'm not going to give up. Right? I think we've all been guilty of this. Now, why do I bring these things up? Because it's a truth that we don't want to acknowledge about ourselves. We're happy to acknowledge it about other people, right? They're imperfect. They're wrong. They don't always get it right. But, it, but it's not a comfortable, pleasing truth for ourselves to look at ourselves and say, I'm the one that is not perfect. I'm the one that is not getting it right, or I'm the one that is wrong, but I'm trying to act like I know everything, or I am in the right. The Bible calls this sin, and it's like the last thing any preacher actually wants to preach about. is <laughs> talking about how you are a sinner. I've never had anybody ever in my history of preaching, and I've been preaching for over 20 years, I'm not going to say the exact number, right? And no one has ever, ever, ever come up to me after a sermon and said, thank you for pointing out my sin, whether in generalities or in specifics. And why? We, we will all sit here and go, hey, no one's perfect, right? Well, we will all agree on that, yet... If we get detailed about specific types of imperfection, specific types of sins, or we start pointing the finger at one another and say, you're a sinner, you're, you're imperfect in this way, what do we do? We begin to defend ourselves, right? We begin in pride to say, well, it's not really that bad, or let me explain the situation, or let me tell you why I did that thing or said that thing. Right, and so what we begin to do is we will know on the inside, I am wrong. I'm a sinner. I'm imperfect. And on the outside, we will defend ourselves to the death. We will rage. We will get angry. We will get loud. We will say, I am good. I am right. I was not wrong, and et cetera. And it just goes on and on and on. So what we need to do is acknowledge the reality of our sinfulness. Even if it's unpleasant, 
even if it's not fun, even if it's not enjoyable. Now here's the question is, I thought we were talking about prayer. (laughs) Well, I wanna encourage you today as we continue studying God's word about prayer to go to God in prayer with your sin. Anybody do that? Does anybody ever do that? Maybe every once in a while? We do it in church, certainly. Sometimes there's guided prayers that we acknowledge our sinfulness, our imperfection. But when I typically think about my own prayer life, I'll bring it up to God every once in a while, right? Like, like if it really starts bothering me, if it really starts making me feel guilty, I'll bring it up to him. But most of our prayer life doesn't discuss that, right? We bring up things that, are good about God, things that we want him to do for us, prayer requests we have for healing or provision for ourselves or someone that we love. So what I wanna do today though is to encourage you in prayer to be willing to bring your sins before God, even if it's, you know, not your favorite thing to do, even if it doesn't, you know, make you excited and be like, oh, I can't wait to have to confess this again. Now here's why I want you to do this. Because the Bible teaches us that it's an important part of prayer and our relationship with God. Now in the very beginning of the sermon series, we spent a long time talking about the foundation of prayer is understanding who our God is. And you will only be willing to pray to God and and bring your sins before him in prayer if you know who he is. Because if I believe that God is waiting there to judge me or to destroy me or to beat me up or condemn me or any other words you wanna throw on it, if I think that's how he's gonna view me because I did this, right? I've met many people who are afraid God will find out that they did the thing. I just don't want them to know. And then my job as the pastor is to be the bad guy and be like, I'm just wanting you to know he's already aware. Right? But we'll, we have this mindset where we want to keep God at a distance. Right? I don't want to pray about this. I don't want to bring it up to him because what? We're afraid of how he'll respond. We are often afraid that he will reject us, he will shame us, he will condemn us, he will judge us, just because we are also afraid of what? Other people will do the same thing. So that's one view of God that many people struggle with. But if our view of God is Jesus, and that he is a savior who forgives all sins, Right, he even tells people that are caught in sin, I don't condemn you. John 3, 16, I know you all know it because I've asked you a bunch of times. How many of you are aware that there's a Bible verse called John 3, 17? Anybody? <laughs> like that the chapter keeps going, right? Well, in John chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus says, I didn't come into the world to condemn it, but to what? To save it. That's the God you are praying to. Even in your sinfulness and your imperfections and your brokenness and whatever guilt or shame you might be carrying with you in your heart and mind, that when you go to God in prayer and you tell him, here is what nobody else knows. Here's my imperfection. Here's my sin. Here's the part of me that I'm finally admitting is not perfect. You are praying to a savior named Jesus who does not condemn you or the world, but instead came to redeem and save you. Now, before we get into Luke 23, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter six. Jesus gives us instructions on how to pray right before he gives us the Lord's prayer. So Matthew chapter six, starting at verse five, and the reason we're gonna look at this is because As a pastor, as I have counseled people and prayed with people, one of the things that people will bring up to me is this. I don't know what to say, right? I don't know how to get started. I don't don't know what to pray. 
And especially that is true when it is something that can be as scary as admitting and confessing our own imperfections and our own sin. So I met people that will go on and on and on and on because they're trying to convince God if I say sorry enough or if I say the right things, then what? He will hear me, he will listen, he will forgive me. And what I want to do today with God's word is to free you from that mindset. So in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus says, would you pray you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their rewards. So Jesus is saying, I don't want you to pray hypocritically, which means I don't want you to pray as if you've got nothing to confess. Right? He doesn't want us to pray and make our entire prayer life of God, I just want to remind you how awesome I was for you this week. So will you please bless me and give me the things I'm about to ask for? Right, and in fact, later on in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus will tell a parable about this mentality when it comes to confessing sin of two men. One, a Pharisee, a good religious church person, and the other a tax collector, and they both show up to pray. And the Pharisee says, dear God, thank you that I am not like him. Now just imagine how awkward that would be. Later on in the service, we're gonna have the prayers of the church. If we just started, and I just encouraged everybody, like, okay, everybody, we're gonna pray out loud. I know that's weird for us, but like, we're just gonna pray from the heart out loud, say whatever you want, and then the person sitting in the pew near you goes, dear Lord, I'm so glad you didn't make me like them. How many of you would have an awkward glance at them at that moment and just be like, I'm done praying now and I wanna talk about this? Anybody? Right, okay, like maybe that's weird to you. What if I did that? What if I was just like, oh Lord, thank you for making me a pastor at Our Savior and thank you for making me not like all of the members? <laughs> would anybody of you say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer? Or some of you would probably storm the altar and be like, would you knock that off? Because it's horrifying, right? It's like, whoa, no, 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 no. We're not supposed to confess other people's sins when we go to God in prayer, right? Because that's what the tax collector or the Pharisee was doing to the tax collector was, I'm here to talk about how awesome I am and to confess sin, but not mine, theirs. And then the tax collector prays, And all his prayers simply, Lord, cover me in your mercy. And you know what Jesus says? The tax collector went home righteous and forgiven. He had the short prayer. He had the simple prayer. It was very few words. And yet, Jesus says that that was the prayer that brought him righteousness and forgiveness. So in Matthew chapter six, Jesus is saying, you don't need to pray like the hypocrites. Don't come to God in your prayers and just start going, I am so great and awesome, and Lord, here's all the things that I have done for you that make, should make you pleased with me. And then also, look how bad all these people are. So that's one way of praying that Jesus says, don't do that. And then if you jump down in Matthew chapter six to verse seven, he says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And here's the reality. I have heard people pray, and I've prayed this way myself, where when you are really convicted, when your heart and mind are weighed down by guilt and shame and something that just kind of won't go away, right? How many times do we tell Jesus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? Would you please forgive me? Would you please forgive me, right? We get into this practice, this habit of, I'm gonna say the prayer, I'm gonna say the words over and over and over and over and over again. And one of the reasons we do that is because of a guilty conscience. We think, if I just say it enough times, maybe he will finally hear me. 
If I tell him sorry enough times, if I ask for forgiveness enough times, maybe the prayer will finally get through and he will forgive me. And yet, what does Jesus say to not do? He says, you don't have to heap up a whole bunch of words. You don't have to come to God with the fanciest prayer ever. You don't have to come to God and say a million phrases a million different times. Right? In the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the tax collector simply says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. That's it. He didn't go into great detail about all his sins. He didn't tell God over and over and over. He just said one simple phrase. Would you have mercy on me because I'm a sinner? Now, if you go to Luke chapter 23, our gospel reading, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Jesus is on the cross. It's Good Friday. There's two people being crucified next to him. And here is what happens. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at Jesus saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us, right? So he's mocking Jesus. He's yelling at Jesus to do something. But the other criminal rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. That's a prayer of confession, right? This man is finally at a point in his life where he's saying, I'm going to admit that I messed up, that that I was the one in the wrong, that I'm a sinner, that I'm imperfect. And even further he goes and says, and I'm getting the just punishment. I'm getting the consequences of my actions. You know, in that first John reading, many of you probably know a line from it because it's used in our liturgy, right? If we confess our sins, God is what? Anybody? Just to forgive our sins. Don't forget that part. (laughs) And cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? We say it all the time, but here's what I want you to think about for a moment. Now, the reason we say it is because it's in God's word and it's beautiful and it's this wonderful reminder of what? God will what? He will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, meaning all sins, every sin you have, everything that makes you feel guilty and ashamed and dirty and whatever else. He's saying, no, I'm going to make you clean from all of it. But there's a first half to that verse, which is if we confess our sins, which means what? I've got sins that I need to confess, right? There there is a point where we have to come to it as humans before God and go, I am imperfect. I sinned. I made mistakes. (laughs) Like the thief on the cross here in verse 41, and indeed we justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. He's finally admitting, I deserve to be punished for my sins. I have done wrong. Now, here's the beautiful thing. In verse 42, he says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's a great prayer. It's one sentence. And really, the prayer is more so just three words. Jesus, remember me. Now, if you wanted to be super religious about it, you could be, and you want to be really legalistic about it, which, by the way, Luther says is the tendency of our hearts. You could say, oh, well, he didn't really get into detail, did he? I mean, he just, he doesn't say wise on the cross, does he? It just says, hey, man, I did some wrong, and I'm, I'm getting what I deserve. He didn't get into super detail. He didn't confess every sin he's ever done. Right? I don't, I don't even see the words, I'm sorry, Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Like, we get so legalistic about this stuff. So we end up beating up ourselves and beating up others. 
and keeping ourselves and others away from the grace of God, thinking, no, you've got to do all these things, and you've got to say these right words, and you've got to say it this many times in order for it to work. And yet, this man in verse 42 says, Jesus, remember me. Don't, don't forget about me. I know I'm a sinner hanging on a cross next to you. And I don't have a, any time left to make amends. Right? He doesn't have any time left to make up for what he did wrong, to go around apologizing. And so all he can say to Jesus is, Will you remember me? And here's the good news for him and for you and for me and every sinner. Jesus said to him in verse 43, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Which is a promise of what? Forgiveness and salvation and eternal life. I just want you to see his prayer again. Jesus, remember me. See, this is the good news for you and I. That when we pray to God, and we've got sin, and we've got things that we're embarrassed about, things we don't want to say out loud, things we're, we're ashamed to confess, we are confessing and praying to the same Jesus this man was. The Jesus that's on the cross, dying to forgive all of those sins for you, and declaring to you, you're going to be with me in paradise. You're going to have eternal life. You're going to have salvation with me. And this is why we can do this joyfully, actually. Right? This is why we repeat First John so often, and we remind ourselves, hey, if I confess my sins, if I admit it to Jesus, he is the Savior that went to the cross for me, and he's going to forgive my sins, and he's going to cleanse me from all of my unrighteousness. And here's what I love about these prayers that we see in God's word that bring about God's mercy. They're not fancy. They're not long. They're not complicated. The tax collector says, have mercy on me, because I'm a sinner. The thief on the cross looks at Jesus on the cross and says, will you remember me? Because they know who they're praying to. They're praying to a God who has mercy on sinners. They're praying to a Jesus who hangs on a cross and dies on a cross to forgive the sins of all people, including the thief, including the tax collector, and including you and me. And this is why in Hebrews chapter 4, it says in verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Right? Not the throne of wrath. Not the throne of condemnation, not the throne of judgment, not the throne of how could you possibly do that, but the throne of what? Great. Come on, Lutherans. You could say grace louder than that. The throne of what? Grace. Yeah. So let us with confidence. So you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to hide in shame and guilt and say, oh, I'll come to God when I got it figured out. I'll come to him in prayer when I'm feeling better or when I've made amends or made up and apologized to the right people. And he says, no, you can come in with confidence because you're going into the throne room of grace. You're going to pray to the God who forgives sinners. You're going to the God who gives mercy to sinners. And then he says, here's why you should do it. That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's saying, when you and I go to God in prayer, when you and I go into that throne room of grace, here's what you're gonna walk out with. Mercy and grace to help in time of need. When you and I go to God to confess our sins, we go to him in prayer and say, God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. 
God, would you please remember me because I, I was really dumb this week. What you're gonna walk away from Jesus with is not a list of commands, not a list of do's and don'ts or are things of here's what you need to do to make up for it to me. What you and I are gonna walk away with is God's mercy and his grace. Because the God you are praying to has mercy on sinners, and the God who you're asking to forgive you is the Jesus who hanged on a cross to give you grace for every time of need and every sin. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are a God of mercy and grace. Give us, Holy Spirit, the confidence to come to the Father in our time of need, in the time of sin and guilt and shame, that we would draw to you in confidence, knowing that you are a Father of mercy and grace, knowing that when we confess our sins to you, faithfully forgive us and make us clean and whole, that when we come to you as a loving Father, what you give to us is mercy and grace. In your name we pray, amen.